What does it take to be a pop idol? In this era of TV talent shows, all powerful producers and lip-syncing celebrities, it seems like marketing savvy matters more than a musical gift. Was the pop music business always this way? My guest today is Robin Gibb. With his brothers, Morris and Barry, he formed the Bee Gees, one of the most successful pop bands ever. Their soundtrack for the movie Saturday Night Fever defined the disco era. Were they really different from the packaged pop stars of today? Robin Gibb, welcome to Hard Talk. Oh, thank uh, you very much. Imagine for a second that the Bee Gees were setting out to make a career in the music business today. What do you think they, you, would make of the pop industry right now? Um, I'm actually saddened by it because I, I don't think, um, I, 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 well, quite honestly, it's, it's karaoke. I mean, it's so how you ever pronounce the word elevator music, the people more posing as being uh, artists, they're, they're not, and it's not just about that. Um, we're composers first and foremost, and uh, we have one of the biggest catalogues in the world. In fact, the biggest, alongside Lennon and McCartney. I mean, we've written for so many other artists apart from ourselves, from Barbara Streisand, Woman in Love, and Islands in the Stream, Chain Reaction, Heartbreak for Dionne Warwick, Emotion for Beyonce, and Words for Ronan Keating, and a whole a host of songs. So we have a two-tier career. A lot of artists today. Um, there just seem to be single artists that, that are chosen for these reality shows. And quite honestly, they've probably never had uh, a history of actually paying their dues and, and working their way in the industry. And when you see uh, a show here in the UK like The X Factor, which has an enormous influence on the charts and which Simon Cowell produces, and of course yeah. he owns the rights to most of the acts that are successful course, yeah. as well. Do you burn with resentment? Um, no, because I see these shows more as television shows rather than actual discovery of talent. And in essence, when these shows go off the air and these guys win, they're on their own. They've got to really prove themselves uh, whether they sink or swim. Sting, I think, he, he said that it, it, the danger is, and you mentioned the word karaoke, as did he, he says the danger is that it's putting popular music back decades. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, 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 is that well, really true? Well, when we first started out, people always said, was it easier? Well, it was harder because you had to be able to sing. You had to have an act. You had to be able to sing live. And record companies would evaluate you on that uh, because for promotion reasons, they wouldn't sign you. And it was much harder to get records on the radio. The standard was higher. And, of course, British music dominated the American charts, which doesn't do today. No, th these days, of course, they have a, something called auto-tune, which means that, you know, if you look great and you've got a style which appeals to the audience, if you're not actually able to sing in tune, if your pitch isn't perfect, something Proteins. can be done about it. Yes. Would the Bee Gees have used it if they could have? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, because we, well, we started writing songs when we were eight years old and started Natural Harmony. Nobody ever taught us anything. So we did it out of fun. Uh, for, for nothing else. We started in Manchester just copying what we heard on the radio and, and imagining what their new single would be like. And as young as eight or nine, we were actually imagining and, and composing music. But Robin Gibb, isn't there a danger, and goodness knows I'm prone to it myself, of thinking that the good old days were always better? I mean, it isn't the truth, and, and I saw it the well, other day. natural is better. You know, if, if something real is always better, how often have you seen on a reality TV show like The X Factor a band that's been around professionally for a few years that have got their act together, can compose music, do their own songs, and, and do harmonies, which no, not many people can do natural harmonies. Yeah, but uh, point taken. But I was struck by something you said the other day about this sort of X Factor phenomenon. You, you described the successful ones on the shows as, quote, overstyled puppets, not mm. musicians, simply a product. But I would put it to you, and I had this conversation recently with Martha Reeves of the Vandellas yes. fame and Motown fame in, in that very chair you're in. And I said to her, in the end, Berry Gordy was treating the musicians that he had on the Motown label as a product, as a commodity to sell. And it's always happened in pop music. I think, well, that's, in, in the terms of Motown, that was probably conveyor belt kind of music. There was a host of that, and Holland Dozier and Holland were writing for a lot of host of artists. 
In our, in our case, we're, we've always composed our own music. We've been our own masters in a sense. We've never relied on other people to write our songs. Our whole catalogue has been composed by us and we've never actually been taught anything about music. Uh, so Didn't your did dad, it. I mean, it is fascinating how you came to be so good at music so young. Thank your dad pushed you very hard, didn't he? Because he, he was a band he leader. He didn't really. He, he didn't know ex exactly what we were doing. He was a band leader, but he never really knew what we were doing because we, 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 we actually did it on our own. It was much later where he actually discovered that we're, because we were, we were very young and we were going out to these places, uh, we, it wasn't like L.A. where you were groomed. No, well, you, you talk L.A. And I mean, there is a concern these days about the sort of the pushing of child stars, yes. Justin Bieber, goodness knows he's still yeah. a teenager, Britney Spears. Yeah, but we never it, had that. Well, it sort of happened to you. When, when you moved to Australia as a family, weren't mm. you sort of pushed onto stages, into talent shows of the time yourself? Uh, only by, by enthusiasm, because that's something we wanted to do. We, for, uh, 4BH was a radio station in Brisbane. They offered us, uh, or Bill Gates, who, who named us the Bee Gees, where it wanted us to go into a, and cut acetate so we could play on his drive time show. That's, and we loved that, you see. And that, but you, you were young at the time. What very were you, young. In, in your early teens? Uh, no, eight, nine. Eight or nine. nine. <laughs> yeah, and Barry about so 11. So you were, you were one of these child stars who was pushed onto stage. And isn't there something a little bit dangerous about that? Well, actually, we were doing it even... Our father was a bush photographer working in the outback of Queensland, and we were doing these things like Redcliffe Speedway. This is where Bill Gates discovered it. And he didn't know anything about it. He was a bit concerned, though, when he came back because, you know, we were minors. Mm. You developed quickly, uh, and as part of your development, you actually came back from Australia to the UK. You must have been, what, 17, eight, 17 when you sang that. Also, it's, it's a very folky, a very hippie yeah, sort of sound. Of, yeah. And a lot of these songs uh, in our catalogue are still on the radio. I mean, I can actually go... And uh, on the radio, I could turn the radio on any given commercial station, including the BBC, and, and hear five Gibber Brothers songs a day, also in America at the same time, as well as here in Europe, uh, because of, of all the other artists that we've written for, as well as ourselves. And, um, but I'm, I'm tempted when I watch that, watch Massachusetts, to say, what happened? What happened to your sound? Because it changed it so did. radically in well, just a few years. Because we're composers, you see. And composers... Uh, don't feel, and, and because of our, we, we, and we've been writing for so long, we felt we had license to go into areas where other people were, would fear to go, especially older artists, because we were so young. Were you, were you really stretching and challenging yourselves, or were you just casting about to find the most commercially successful sound? Um, well, composers just like to be adventurous. We were having fun. It's like Islands in the Stream is the most successful country song, and we've never really lived in Memphis or Nashville, <laughs> and for Dolly Parton. And, uh, and then uh, it's just, you know, we're, uh, we're not country artists, but we wrote that. Um, but we've always loved R&B and uh, even soul. And well, the soul being a key word, because for a while after Massachusetts, and a few other hits which were, were sort of more hip, hippie folky, yes. you, you really adopted this sort of um, uh, funk soul thing. Yeah. And you were called the, the, the blue-eyed soul boys. Yeah. But you, went, you left the UK to develop that sound, didn't you? You went to Miami. We had to. And we worked with the Reef Mardin, who was a brilliant producer. Well, there was a point where we wanted to explore what we were doing. We were composers, we were, and we were still very young. We wanted the transition. We wanted to explore American music, and black, black music particularly, because it was where you know, it, we felt the future was going to be. But, but it's when you mentioned Arif Mardin, and he said, and I saw the quote the other day, he said, what, what he wanted you to do was to forget, and this is his words, forget that you were three white boys from Manchester. Yes. <laughs> How easy was that? that? Well, it, it, the fact of the matter is, he loved the harmonies and he loved the, uh, the, the writing. But he, he just saw us as composers and recording artists, which is what we loved doing. And we never worried about image or anything like that. And all we cared about, we lived and breathed the recording studio. And although Arif was then a great producer, we did all the work, we did all the, co the composing. He was just the, the guy that said, that's it, come to that, do that and that. But the thing was, we did live and breathe. And it was in the studio, nothing waited until tomorrow. If it was something sounded good to him, so you'd do it today. 